as, as impediments to what she wanted. What we found when we looked at the records was that these people were in such financial straits that they had applied for a loan shortly before the murders and they had been turned down for that loan because their finances were in such poor condition. They were behind on their mortgage. They were behind on credit card payments. They were living beyond their means. They were living large, as they would say. Furniture, uh, cars, uh, boats, uh, vacations. I mean, they were living a grand lifestyle uh, that, that if you and I had looked from the outside, we said, these people are doing great. But on the inside, they were hemorrhaging money, and they simply couldn't afford that lifestyle in reality. Besides, Darley seemed to have contemplated suicide, writing a note in her diary to her children. work for Darley, trying to get the word out there that she's innocent. And last resort would be maybe clemency by the governor? Well, Darley and I won't accept life in prison uh, right from the beginning. She said she'd rather be dead than to live her life for, in prison for something she didn't do. So um, we fight for her innocence, for her to be freed, or at least get a new trial. But worst case scenario, if she doesn't get a new trial, if procedures go on, are you prepared for the worst case scenario? No, I'm not. I will never be prepared for that. If they kill her, they kill me. So, uh, I know it's a possibility. Uh, I hope I'm not here if that happens. How would you face a moment like that? Is there anything? I, I would not watch her execution. I would not watch them murder my daughter. She wouldn't want that. I don't know what I'll do. But for 15 years now, all appeals have been denied. Darley is still being kept in this solitary cell awaiting execution. It looks like a gesture of defiance that Darley has herself photographed in prison as if she were taking a short break from normal life. From the moment of her arrest, she has proclaimed her innocence. From death row, Darley Rudier continues to proclaim she's innocent of murdering her two young boys. Now, Werner Herzog speaks with the investigators on the case. And in Darlie Routier's case, you are completely convinced that the right person is I'm completely, convicted. absolutely convinced. There's no, there's no, no doubt in my mind. Uh, and, and you don't know me well enough to know this. If I had any doubt, I would tell you very quickly. But I do not. No doubt. And you look at the sum total. Everything there points to Darlie. There's absolutely nothing that points to anyone else. I had uh, initially some reservation about there were two people in that house. So I was uh, concerned about uh, Darren Routier as well. This is Darren Routier, the husband, who was also in the house. He has since divorced Darley and remarried. Ever since the crime, he has steadfastly proclaimed her innocence. This is very, uh, very stressful, very uh, anxiety. You know, it's just very difficult to uh, to see my wife being portrayed as someone she's not. And when uh, when the time comes out, you're going to see a totally different picture because to to know Darlie is to love her. Quite obvious to me that the the story that she spun was not true, not even close to the truth. I might give her a mistake or two, but the whole scenario 
did not fit. Does not fit today. Didn't fit. Didn't fly then. It won't fly now. I kept asking the police, "Tell me again, what what is her story here? What did she say happened? Let me try to make sense of this. I just couldn't make sense of it using her her story. And then then when you find, as the police did, the the screen that had been cut, and then you find the knife inside her kitchen that had the particles on it that were identical to the particles on the screen that had been cut, then you really have a problem, don't you? Because now you have to believe that an intruder came somehow magically into the home. He then took a bread knife from her kitchen. He cut the screen in a nice neat T pattern. And then he puts the knife back in and then picks up another knife out of her kitchen and commits these horrible crimes. It just, it becomes more fantastic every time that you look at another piece of physical evidence here. Uh, that knife was a rounded tip bread knife. If you've seen a to cut bread, uh, it's serrated. That knife couldn't have went in that screen and cut it. What we've found out since... Why, why couldn't it do that? Because it has a round tip. Why would you use a serrated round tip knife when you've got a whole block of knives to cut that screen? I mean, you've got... It doesn't make any sense. We do know this. We know that she went to great efforts to stage a crime scene. We know, for instance, the lamp, I mean, the flower arrangement in the, in the den where the two children were, it's staged when it's knocked over. We know the vacuum cleaner in the kitchen. We know that Darlie Routier placed that after the fact. There are bloody footprints underneath there, and those bloody footprints match the footprints of Darlie Routier. Let's go back through Darlie's story, right? The intruder, she wakes up, the intruder's running away from her. He breaks the glass before she ever gets in the kitchen. Uh, she chases this man through the kitchen where he then conveniently drops the knife in the utility room for her. So then she backs away and eventually calls the police. The, uh, the blood underneath the vacuum cleaner again, uh, the blood on the vacuum cleaner, uh, again, her blood, uh, that is shown to be dropping straight down on to the blood onto the vacuum cleaner the blood that's on the handle of the vacuum cleaner that again is her blood consistent with her actually taking the handle and laying it down the marks where you can see where the vacuum cleaner was rolled on that floor in the blood before it was dropped on the on the floor itself I mean, that's just some of the physical evidence in the kitchen that would contradict everything that she said. Here's, here's the, the bigger problem with all of the blood and all the DNA in this case. And let's, let's remember, at the time that this case was tried, no case had ever had more DNA samples tested in it in this state. I mean, we had more than 100 DNA samples tested. We literally were able to create a DNA map for that home and that crime scene. Of all those 100 DNA samples, we had zero none that were unidentified. All of those samples could be linked to one of three people, either Devon, Damon, or Darlie Routier. There's nothing to indicate that anybody else was ever in that home. So no, there's, there's no intruder. Uh, there's no mystery killer. This isn't a, a new episode of The Fugitive where we have a one-armed man free out here running free. That's just not, that's not the facts here. Stephen Cooper, you are Darlie Routier's post-conviction attorney, what's her line of defense? Well, primarily the uh, issue is that she is innocent in fact. And the, uh, we have evidence developed since the trial that clearly demonstrates that. And uh, we hope to develop some more with some DNA tests that are pending or that we hope to get ordered soon. The evidence that the state elicited was based primarily almost exclusively on opinions of experts who were not qualified to render those opinions, um, didn't do the necessary um, background investigation in order... Give me one example, please. Well, um, the uh, a fellow named James Cron came into the scene here at four or five o'clock in the morning, and it was a horrific, bloody scene um, 
evidence, i.e. blood, evidence, and other things throughout the house. And he, by his own testimony in front of the jury, said that he concluded in his walkthrough, within 20 minutes of being there, that Darley did it. And so he formed that opinion without having the blood spatter evidence, without having done any, any of the forensic stuff that is needed to do in a, in a messy crime scene. He had already concluded that she was guilty. And that, that, um, that biased the rest of the investigation because from 20 minutes onto the scene, they were then investigating evidence, quote, evidence to prove that she was guilty, not developing evidence to determine who may have committed this crime. We now return to the details of the investigation that put Darley Routier on death row. There's one uh, strange, mysterious item, a sock, bloody, found about 75 yards in an alley. Uh, how do you explain that? Well, we know that the sock contained the blood of the two boys. We know that from yes. analysis. I found, it, I found it strange that the sock was found next to a storm drain uh, and it was laying out exposed as though whoever left it there wanted it to be found. Um, if, you're going, if you're going to try to hide evidence, you don't do it that way. What you do is you either, A, you throw it in a trash can in the alley, or you throw it down the storm drain. But you don't leave it out there as though it's just a marker. Say, look at me, find me. And that's really what that thing was. And I, th I don't know when that was planted, but I think that was planted by Darley at some point in the, in the night. The state's theory is that she killed these children and then staged the crime scene, part of which was taking a sock that had both Devon and Damon's blood on it, as well as faint DNA of my client on it, and took it down the alley 75 yards. And you would exclude uh, theories that bloody socks levitate? I would exclude that. And you would exclude that a bloody sock has wheels and travels 75 yards. Not this bloody sock. I've seen it. Do you have an explanation how it was possible that drips of blood of her sons ended up on the back of her nightgown? I do. I think that when she was, she stabbed these boys so hard uh, just, just the motion of the knife going up and down would put some drops on the back of her shirt. Um, they were stabbed hard enough to where it went, the knife went through their body and actually chipped the concrete floor underneath them. That's a lot of force. I think that her hand would have to go, go back pretty far behind her back or over her head. Their explanation for how if, if she had stabbed the children and then cut herself, how they would all be in these microscopic dots is that miraculously these pieces of, of drops of blood flew in the air and landed on top of the blood that was already there from uh, killing the boys. We have experts that says the mathematical possibilities of that happening are just extreme.